KU University and Professor Hong Su from Beijing Normal University and uh, Mr. Zefian from Microsoft Asia. Uh, also, we have we are connect to our remote participants from KU University. And we are having a little bit technical problem. That's why the session is delayed a little bit. Can, okay, our remote participants are Professor Jim Foster, who who is a co-organizer with me from the KU University, and also there is Professor Jim Mungai uh, from KU University, who is dean of the School of Information and Environmental Studies, and also a former board member of ICANN, and who is a very strong supporter of the this inter, uh, IGF uh, process. So, okay, uh, in this session we are trying to examine four or five questions about privacy in Asia and they are, uh, what are some of the current frameworks for protecting privacy online in different countries in Asia? That means, um, okay, actually first thing, the meaning of privacy itself might be different in Asia than they normally understand uh, by the privacy term in the Western countries and uh, also Privacy is a new thing in many of the Asian countries, like uh, many of the developing countries especially, uh, and some of them are drawing from the European Union framework and some of the things come from the, uh, the US uh, framework and they have their own uh, things locally and how they are integrating uh, those things uh, in uh, these Asian countries. And also there is a lot of things going on about harmonization and alignment of national privacy regulations and national privacy regimes across the Asian region. Uh, we'll talk about that and also uh, we'll talk about how exactly the panelists will talk about how exactly the resulting Asian approach to privacy will be different from the European Union and the US approach to privacy uh, and also uh, the other thing that we examine in this uh, panel is that who are the main participants in the privacy debate in uh, those Asian countries like the government or the special interest group or trade association or professional association or uh, maybe the, the technology vendors, consumers, uh, like what are their different roles? And a lot of concerns in the European Union countries and maybe also in Japan is that the strict privacy regulation, because of the strict privacy regulation, businesses have, have not been able to utilize uh, these modern information and communication technologies like cloud computing, big data, and all those modern things, and how exactly uh, the privacy things or the uh, strictness of the privacy regulations have affected that. So we focus on these five things. Uh, let's quickly check one more time if our remote participation is working. So, no, it's only, I'll just stop here uh, because we have four panelists here and how is the remote participation? Professor Jun Murai wants to, like, I would like him to talk a little bit about the thing, maybe a couple of minutes, then you'll be the first speaker. So first, second, third, fourth, actually we are in that order. So any, any, any progress? Keshu uh, Okay. Okay, if, if this thing works again, and we'll, come, we'll go back to KU, okay? Meantime, we'll start our presentation with Hong, okay? Okay, good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Well, thank you so much for giving me the opportunity to present as the first one since, uh, uh, well, there's a clash of schedule for me. I need to run for another workshop maybe in uh, 40 minutes. I'm sorry about that, but I'm happy to answer any question after my short presentation. Um, I would respond to Neil's uh, kind questions uh, one by one. I changed the sequence a little bit. I moved question number five to number three. <laughs> so, but I address all of them. What I'm talking about is the privacy in China, the law and the practices. It's pretty good. This is the legal panel. We're going to talk about the legal issues. Um, uh, please go back to the first page. Um, right. Well, this is the last page, actually. <laughs> um, well, okay, for the legal framework in China on privacy protection, uh, 
Well, it has been growing uh, very uh, quickly. Uh, well, page two, please. Thank you. Uh, what we can see is the most important, significant development is the decision enacted by National People's Congress Standing Committee on Strengthening Network Information Protection at the end of uh, December 2012. Uh, this is so far the most important legal sources for uh, uh, privacy and uh, personal data protection on the Internet. National People's Congress is Chinese uh, Parliament, is the highest legislature. National People's Congress Standing Committee is the uh, work body of the uh, highest legislature. So the decision even is not called as a law because it's too brief and, and too principal. Uh, it didn't go to, uh, it does not go to much details, but however, it outlined a couple of key principles on privacy protection on the internet. Uh, within China's legal framework. So this is the most important things, and the people are very much enthusiastic about this enactment of the decision. There are other laws. I have to say in China, there's no comprehensive privacy law, uh, but it's addressed in uh, different subjects of law. For example, the tort liability law enacted in 2007. Uh, the importance of that law is it grants, for the first time, the civil rights to privacy. So at, so that at least data subject can claim that privacy is its independent uh, private and civil rights. And that legal remedy is be, if it is being, infu is being infringed, that's pretty important. And there's other laws, such as criminal law. The criminal law has long uh, recognized legal protection for privacy. If those organizations or institutions handling personal data and then selling and misappropriate these data, they were subject to legal punishment. Apart from these laws enacted by legislatures, there are other administrative regulations uh, addressing different aspects of privacy and personal data protection. For example, uh, there are a couple of uh, administrative regulations protecting network security and data protection and the privacy are actually incorporated in those uh, protection. And also there's uh, 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 administrative regulations uh, regulating market order in internet information services and they address the obligation of the service, of the service provider on data and the privacy protection. Next page, please. Uh, I've tried to outline what has been protected and addressed in Chinese legal framework regarding privacy and personal data. First of all, the principle is very much in common sense and is uh, widely recognized across the region and around the world. Uh, for data collection, uh, process, communication, and uh, dissemination, it must be subject to data subjects' consent. So the informed consent is the number one principle for privacy protection. The other principles, such as collecting data, should be subject to the principle of uh, legitimacy, necessity, and just uh, vacation. Uh, for the legality, it means uh, it, 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 you should never uh, leak or steal the other people's uh, personal data. For necessity, it means the data should be collected to the scope of uh, uh, necessity. Only uh, necessary information should be collected. Uh, or expensive collection is not permitted. Um, what is also important is that uh, under the decision enacted by National People's Congress Standing Committee, is there any question? I'm happy to respond to that. <laughs> um, another principle has been established in China is that for the first time uh, since the enactment of the decision by National People's Congress Standing Committee, uh, all the information service providers are supposed to publish their own privacy policy. This is pretty new in China. If you go to Chinese websites, it's different from the Facebook or Twitter. You can hardly find a privacy policy, but it's now become a mandatory obligation. Another issue <coughs> is quite relevant to privacy protection in China is that for the internet access services and for the telecom services, under the Chinese law, all the user must submit uh, their real name information. This is a real name checking system. 
And in that case, those information service provider, including internet access provider and telecom service provider, they're actually maintaining and collecting a large amount of personal data. Uh, and in response to this real name requirement, the, the legal obligation for personal uh, data protection on these services is comparatively higher. Um, uh, another observation is that under the Chinese legal system, we can see many administrative regulation and the public law remedies. And if you breach the data protection laws, you're subject to administrative liability or criminal liability. It could be subject to penalties. But for the civil remedies, and um, how to directly address the private uh, engravement of data subjects, that's comparatively weak. That's unfortunate and should be enhanced in the future. For data subject, they, uh, they are now uh, entitled to uh, declare, uh, to request the service provider to remove the infringed information. If it's really a leakage of personal data, they're supposed to ask these information removed. Uh, but there's uh, no other remedy uh, available to data subjects. That's uh, uh, pretty unfortunate because data protection uh, uh, fundamentally is to protect the human rights and subject matter, data subjects' rights, not protect the public order. And, and uh, of course, as I said at the last point, the public law protection is pretty strong. Next page, please. Okay, uh, the second question is on this uh, uh, possible harmonization or unification in Asia-Pacific region. What well, is a very good question. Uh, in China, Chinese government is very much emphasizing the cross-border e-commerce. Uh, and they believe uh, that uh, uh, the future development of international trade will be uh, primarily relying on this cross-border electronic commerce and Chinese government. Uh, with the 12 uh, agency, including Ministry of Commerce, General Administration of Customs, uh, these uh, key stakeholders they issued a circular on development and facilitation of cross-border e-commerce. So they really see the potential uh, to uh, selling the goods and services through the internet. And in that case, it will inherently involve the a data flow uh, uh, in and out of the uh, Chinese border. But this is a very important issue. And I assume uh, the other big economies or the, uh, the other economies in Asia are also developing this international trade through online e-commerce platform. Uh, so there is a great potential for developing this harmonious uh, data protection uh, legal framework. There's, there's a need for this. Think about the e-commerce is uh, naturally borderless. And when data flow uh, through uh, across different jurisdictions, they could be serious and fierce for conflict and laws. And that's really a big headache for these e-commerce providers. If there could be harmonious and really respectable legal framework in the region, that really a great blessing to the development of e-commerce. What I can see are things that uh, Neil kindly asks us to see the perspective of this uh, uh, collaboration or harmonization. Oh, I do believe uh, uh, they, there is a, a big possibility to develop con comparable protection in different Asian countries. I do know uh, in Indonesia, Malaysia, Singapore, and, and India, they're all developing uh, the privacy and personal data law. And for those uh, basic principles are very much in common, as I mentioned, for the Chinese personal data protection, uh, those basic three principles, the consent, legality, and, and necessity, they're widely accepted. So it is possible, at least with respect to basic protection of privacy and personal data, to harmonize in this region. But of course, we need a legal framework, how to harmonize that. Apart from the soft law, non-binding principle that the countries or stakeholders can 
subscribe. Uh, would it be in the legal framework? Uh, we, we see many uh, free trade agreement uh, that's been concluded in this region. And of course, the Trans-Pacific Partnership Agreement is being negotiated, and we see some provision in those free trade agreement. Is that the right direction to go? <laughs> we include data protection in the free trade regime, or this region is still unprepared for this regional legal harmonization. Next page, please. Okay, uh, uh, this is on cloud computing and big data. What I can see is that um, uh, China is really developing this uh, big data business. It's creating new business model, actually. And this um, has um, stirred the concern on data security and data sovereignty. And, uh, in my experience of drafting uh, the Chinese government regulation on internet retailing um, rules, uh, what they see is that they do believe the big data, especially the data connected by this huge internet transactional platform like Alibaba, the world number one transactional platform, is bigger than is bigger than Amazon and uh, eBay. Those data on the platform is already impactful to the national economic security, and the location and the retention of these data uh, should be subject to legal regulation. And if this is another legal area to presume, uh, we can see another area of conflict of law. So maybe we should take into account and think about harmonization. Next page, please. Um, okay, for the international model, uh, we see the U.S. model is primarily run on the private sector's uh, commitment, and the EU model is heavily regulated. Uh, we, we know uh, comments on the uh, advantages of EU model, but the Asia approach, uh, that's really uh, uh, nice for uh, thinking. Uh, well, if we use the wisdom of Confucianism, uh, the, the, what, what is something in the middle is always the uh, better solution. So probably it is a regulation model along with private sector's commitment. Uh, we work from the both sides. Next page, please. Um, oh. Okay, the stakeholder groups involved in these uh, uh, privacy protection uh, in China. The most important stakeholder group is government, of course. Uh, well, they, they wouldn't like to be called a stakeholder, they're regulators. And there's private sector, the businesses. Uh, the, the, well, what is important is that there's not really purely private sector because the state enterprises is now occupying as over 50% of the whole economy. Uh, so their businesses, especially the telecom, Chinese telecom market is not being deregulated, so it's still heavily uh, occupied by the big operators. And there's the other public services. What I mean is that they are, they could be non-profit, it could be for profit. For example, educational services operating on the internet. Uh, these organizations are uh, offering services and collecting a huge amount of data. They are very much a stakeholder in this regime. And last but not least, uh, the internet community in China. What we see is really interesting, these internet community in China, uh, they have become very much articulate. Uh, they have uh, uh, convening their message on uh, data protection and data security. So, okay, this is my briefing. I'm sorry I'm taking a longer time than I'm supposed to be. Thank you. Thank you very much, Professor Hong. Uh, actually, Professor Hong has another conflicting session, uh, uh, and she has to go to that session after some time. Uh, so uh, there, she will not be here for the question answer session at the end. And if you have anything that you'd like to ask Professor Hong, let's do that right now. So anyone has any question about uh, data privacy regulation in Asia? I mean, sorry, China? Yes, please. I just wondered if you're able to comment on the uh, Ministry of Information Technologies um, notice on smartphone measures, um, which are intended to protect privacy on smart devices. Um, do you have any comment on that? Because it was missing from your list. But, uh, uh, sorry, you, you mean the uh, National People's Congress uh, decision or another circular? Uh, I mentioned, the, oh, yeah, the two different things. 
So, uh, MIT, uh, there is a notice on smartphone security measures, and it's intended to address both the security of data on devices and also the privacy of data on devices, and requires, for example, consent for the prior installation of applications that may access people's data, etc. So, it's one of the first things that I've seen in Asia that's trying to address smartphone privacy. Well, thank you for the question. Uh, it's a brilliant one. Um, well, uh, if you ask my observation, uh, what I can see is that um, uh, the privacy uh, protection uh, for the long time in China has been backseated, and uh, the service provider uh, obligation to the government is very much the priority. In any case, they should submit the data in their possession uh, to the government for law enforcement purposes. Uh, this is, there's no uh, compromise or exception to that. And uh, for network security, uh, well, there's very good uh, perspective. Uh, for a very long time, before uh, 2007's tort liability law, before privacy has been recognized as independent uh, civil rights in Chinese legal uh, system, those administrative regulations uh, provide sorts of data protection, but privacy protection is only the byproducts. Uh, what is most important is to safeguard the network security. So, uh, yes, um, we can see the correlation of these uh, security and the privacy, but at the same time, the privacy, it, it, it seems uh, uh, not the priority uh, when they work together. Right, thanks. Okay, so there is another question for Professor Hong. Uh, yes, thank you. Um, I just wanted to ask a clarification regarding uh, the real name policy that you mentioned. Uh, precisely, I want to know uh, what its scope is and the content. For example, does it apply to m uh, microblogging, which I know is uh, quite popular in China? Um, yes, could you elaborate, please? Oh, right. Uh, the real name system uh, is widely uh, applied in China, um, uh, primarily in two areas. One area is the telecom market. If you apply for a mobile phone or apply a fixed line telephone, you have to submit your real name information verified by your, by your um, uh, photo ID. And another area is internet access services. You are very right. It's not limited to the ISP, but also uh, expanding to the ICP, such as the microblogging. For example, you want to register an account as a signer label. You need to submit your real name information and will be verified. Yeah, this is legal requirement. It's not subject to operator's business policy. Time for only one more question, please. So we have to move to other speakers. Okay, uh, who wants to? Let's do two. Okay, go ahead. Okay, please. sorry about that. Uh, Professor Hong, um, I would like to ask, um, we know that in 2008, uh, APEC um, introduced a privacy framework, an APEC privacy framework across the region uh, known as the Pathfinder project. My question would be, uh, has China found this um, framework useful? and? Uh, have they adopted parts of that framework uh, within this? I think uh, the question could be useful for countries who are uh, about to start on their path uh, in introducing privacy laws, and uh, China's experience would be helpful here. Thank you. Well, thank you so much. But you just uh, remind me something I really want to address, but I forgot. Uh, yes, uh, China um, has been a part of this uh, APEC uh, privacy program. And actually, there's the e-business alliance at APEC that's funded by Chinese government. And then the uh, Chinese government is looking at these principles. Um, and uh, I recently uh, completed a project with the Chinese government to research, re reassess the impact of these principles from APEC and whether uh, they could be uh, kind of uh, introduced into Chinese uh, international trade through e-commerce system. Uh, yes, it's very much being researched in China. And that's a very good starting point for our regional harmonization with respect to our data law. Thank you. Okay. Yeah, um, I have a question. When I, <coughs> when I heard um, Professor Hong mentioned about the big data produced by, by e-commerce operators um, should be regulated by law. That, <clears throat> that concerns me a little bit in terms of security because that can go either way. And can you elaborate on, on your idea of regulation of, of big data? 
Oh, oh, thank you. That's also my concern. Uh, uh, for the example, you will think about Alibaba. Uh, they have all the economic data for the, maybe one third of Chinese small and medium sized enterprises on their platform. And that's one of the uh, things that is going to be regulated pretty soon in China is the location of their server. If they, they, they want to cloud their data out in the United States, data center, I guess Chinese government will be really thrilled. <laughs> right, they, they think about at least the data retention should be subject to stricter, uh, stricter scrutiny. Uh, well, that's only one of the concerns. There will be the other concerns. <laughs> Okay, let's thank Professor Hong for a very nice presentation about China. Uh, and we'll move to Professor Fumio Shimpo from Keio University, and he'll talk about Japan. Okay, I think they are still working on that. So, still, the remote participation is not working still, right? Yeah. Oh, right, let's start that. Uh. Could, you, could you open my, my presentation file? Well, next, uh, I'm Fumio Shinpo, professor of Keio University, Faculty of Policy Management. Before starting my presentation file, uh, may I introduce a little bit myself? The areas of my expertise is uh, constitutional law, and, and also cyber law is my main field for research. And I have served uh, several committee member on civil councils on on government of Japan as a specialist of privacy and information security. And currently, I'm in charge of the vice chair of the OECD working party on information and security. Well, let's start my presentation. Yes, uh, my, the title of my presentation is Current Framework and the Future Approach for Protecting Privacy in Japan. And there are five questions as the Bali IGF panel proposal. Um, and there are five questions. And um, the first question, I will explain about this question with respect to the current legal framework for protecting personal information in Japan and ongoing issues and consideration for protecting privacy from the point of personal data protection, which includes PII and non-PII. And second question, uh, I have prepared a PowerPoint slide sheet to discuss about the harmonization and not the harmonized aspects of differences between EU, USA, and ASEAN countries. There are some efforts for promoting to protect privacy by coordinating cross-border enforcement, as you know. And regarding the sound question, the, uh, I, I also made a uh, PowerPoint slide sheet to illustrate to express, explain this question. And the fourth question is, uh, who are the key actors? Uh, this is a very difficult question to answer for regarding the, in Japan, because Japan does not have any supervisory authority. So therefore, I am the one of the key actors in, in privacy deba debate in Japan. <laughs> <laughs> um, but, however, there are no privacy advocates in, in Japan. Um, and, Next five question is uh, regarding the cloud computing and such new services regarding the handling of personal information from the point of the big data. There are no restriction for using cloud services in Japan. And, and also regarding big data utilization, some companies are trying to promote big data businesses. However, some cases are strictly criticized by consumers. Uh, next slide, please. Yeah, next, next slide. Yeah, next slide is the, the brief introducing the history of establishment of laws relating to personal data protection in Japan. Yeah, and the next slide. Yeah, th this sheet is for, for, for the purpose of, uh, I made this sheet for, to illustrate the relationship between uh, OECD, APEC, and the EU, and uh, Japan, and the USA, and some countries. And next slide, please. 
Oh, next, next slide, please. Yeah. Yeah, in Japan, consideration of personal data protection laws in private sector on the national level has been performed by the government since July 1999. Uh, at that time, a personal data protection uh, was only for the, based on the guideline for private, private sector. Therefore, uh, the government decided to enact a law for a comprehensive scheme for personal information protection. The new law has been enacted in May 2003. Ten years have passed since the law enacted. And at the same time, an administrative agency personal data protection law and independent administrative corporation personal data protection law took effect. This new administrative personal information data protection law was a complete overhaul of the 1988 law. Uh, in Japan, we enacted uh, the first law in 1988 based on the OECD guidelines. And all of these personal data protection laws has been shaped around the main points of the OECD pri privacy guidelines using the personal data protection laws applicable to private sector as an example. Uh, uh, and it, it was referred to the eight OECD privacy guidelines and next slide, please. And then the second generation of legislative efforts consider the protection of personal data as a separable fundamental right distinct from the right to privacy. The Japanese data protection legislative structure is based on three main laws related to, related to the personal protection and enacted on May 30, 2003. Um, and also there are several laws regarding the uh, administ administrative agencies and independent administrative agencies. And next slide, please. And in order to save time, please refer to the PowerPoint slide. There are five law, main laws regarding the personal information protection law uh, in Japan. And next slide, next slide please. And the, this, this is the structure of current Japanese personal information protection law. Uh, there are basic policy and, and those personal information protection law and several guidelines. And next slide, please. Yeah, next. Um, and this is a slide for explaining the private sector and public sector. The Japanese law is a comprehensive personal information protection law. However, this area, the private and public sector, is divided into several laws. Next slide, please. And this is a problem of the current Japanese law. As you see, there are many guidelines. Uh, I counted the number of guidelines. Uh, there are 42 guidelines for each competent minister enacted the guidelines because Japan does not have any supervisory authority. It means uh, uniform supervisory authority in Japan. Therefore, each competent minister has a right to enforce the law. Therefore, based on these guidelines, each ministry and each minister has a right to enforce law. So there, there, therefore, 42 guidelines have been enacted for, for the enforcement of law. A uh, very complicated structure of Japanese uh, guidelines. Next slide, please. Yes, I'm, I, I have skipped the, this slide. Next slide, please. Next slide. And next slide, please. Yes. And next, I'd like to talk about a little bit uh, the current effort for protecting privacy from the point of uh, several uh, ministry guidelines. At the first guideline is for the smartphone users, uh, report of the study group on the use and the flow of personal data for protecting privacy and personal information for smartphone users. And next, next slide, please. Well, um, the, based on the discussion of the consumer issues and ICT and its working group, um, the name of the report is the Smartphone Privacy Initiative. 
The purpose of smartphone privacy initiative is that to implement medium and long-term development of a smartphone uh, market with proper handling of information and improvement of user literacy. And the comprehensive plan for smartphone privacy has been proposed so as to allow the user to access services in a safe and secure manner. So next slide, please. And this plan at first presents a smartphone user information handling guideline widely applicable to relevant business operators of smartphones. And also this initiative proposes measures for improving the effectiveness of the guideline. For example, a system for the verification of application by a third party is proposed as one of the measures for protecting privacy of consumers, of uh, smartphone users. Next slide, please. And regarding the structure of smartphone services, uh, in order to save time, please refer to the PowerPoint slide. And this slide is open to public on the website of Ministry of, uh, of Internal Affairs of Communication in Japan. Next slide, please. And the current situation regarding the information collection by application and its purposes, there are many mal malware for collecting information through application, smartphone application. Yeah, thank you. And next slide, please. And next slide is uh, explanation for the current effort for new national ID, ID law. The new law has just been enacted for the purpose of using new national identification for uh, social welfare and national uh, taxation. So I'd like to explain this slide, but this is uh, from the point of the using of information by the, this, this new national identification system. That very complicated and very difficult to explain for me. So please forgive me, just illustrate, just uh, see that this slide. Yes, next slide, please. And the next effort is for the protection of personal data. Uh, it means the personal data is already protected by the based on the Japanese personal information protection law. However, the world personal data that is used in this slide, it's not the personal information, the meaning it's a little bit different from personal information in, in Japan. Uh, it means following the discussion that concerning the scope of protected information related to an individual so we define personal data as information about an individual in general, not limited to information which is personally identifiable and defined as protected personal data. For example, information about individual to be protected. And next slide, please. And based on the notion that this personal data protection should be handled in accordance with the context of the, uh, at the time of data acquisition and with the level of privacy of data. And uh, re regarding the method of rule making for personal data utilization, uh, as I, I mentioned before, Japan does not have any supervisory authority competent with the accreditation standard. Therefore, a multi-stakeholder process is one of the solutions to solve the current problem and establish the new framework. And at the same time now, we are preparing a new national supervisory authority for to compete with these accreditation standards. And in order to promote utilization of personal data, it is appropriate to make the maximum use of technologies to protect privacy, for, for example, by using anonymization and encryption. And next slide, please. Yeah, and, and last, lastly, I, I'd like to mention about the current ongoing issue and current ongoing consideration regarding the protection of personal data in Japan. Uh, the, currently, the IT strategy headquarter committee is now under consideration for uh, establishing the new super, uh, national supervisory authority based on 
the personal information protection law. Therefore, until the end of this year, 2013, the report for law review of current Japanese personal data, uh, personal information protection law will be uh, open to public until the end of this year. So therefore, now we are uh, rushing into uh, consider to establish the new supervisory authority for uh, to to compete into with the accreditation standard of uh, privacy commissioners conference and stuff like that. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Professor Simpo. Let's see. We have we have yeah, we have time for three questions. Uh, then we'll move to the next speaker. So anyone has any, any question about privacy in Japan? Yes, please. Thank you, Professor uh, from your, uh, from your uh, presentation. I just want to ask some more questions about, uh, you mentioned that you are in the process of amending the uh, regulation in, in Japan. And could you please explain, is it for the uh, comprehensive on the, or the sectoral? And then the second one, how is the Japanese perception of the community of the privacy? Thank you. Well, the current Japanese personal information law uh, is a comprehensive law. So it covers uh, both public and private sector. And the, the new law, which will be, uh, uh, that law will be amended soon so and also the new law will also cover whole area of both public and private sector law and however there are several uh, sectoral law for protecting for example uh, the secrecy of the communication and uh, there are some sectoral law H however the, from the point of the governmental law there, there are only one comprehensive law uh, is the current Japanese privacy protection uh, personal information protection law yeah, thank you. Let's see if anyone is, please. Yeah, thank you for your very extensive uh, presentation about this OECD and APEC, and together with uh, what's happening in Japan. And could you uh, explain a little bit more about how Japan is trying to harmonize with this uh, guidelines provided with uh, APEC and OECD in this sense? Yeah, thank you. Yeah. Well, as you know, the new OECD guideline has been amended uh, 21st of July in this year and opened to public the 9th of September in 2013. The main point for, main point for the uh, amendment of this new OECD guideline is that new guideline provides that privacy enforcement authority and privacy management program. And there are some main focus on for protecting personal information. So therefore, now the cabinet office is now under, the Japanese government, the cabinet office now is now under consideration for amending personal information protection law uh, based on the amendment of the new OECD guideline. Because OECD, a new OECD guideline provides that that it is necessary to establish the privacy enforcement authority. So however, Japan does not have any supervisory authority. And also, we have not yet uh, been able to attend the Privacy Commissioner's Conference. And also, uh, privacy, we, uh, actually, we attend the Privacy Commissioner's Conference. But we attend, participate in the conference as an just an observer. And at the same time, we have not yet been able to attend the GPEN, Global Privacy Enforcement Network. So therefore, the one of the uh, effort for the passing the OECD guideline is to establish a new supervisory authority competent with the accreditation of the new national uh, OECD guideline. At, and at the same time, regarding the CBPR program, we joined the CPPR program last month. So therefore now we are trying to pass and we are trying to make a join to the APEC and also the APEC effort and particularly CPEA and APPA. 
has already be we are a member of this member. Mm. Yeah, thank you. Okay, uh, time for one more quick question. If anyone has anything, yes, please. Uh, Professor, I thought it was fascinating that uh, Japan made a decision not to have a central regulating body and now it's analyzing whether it should because of the OECD guidelines. Uh, could you share maybe some of the experiences it had uh, not having uh, the central regulatory body? Maybe there, there are some advantages or disadvantages that you've discovered. Thank you. Even if we, we don't have any such a su central supervisory authority, ha however, uh, uh, maybe you remember that there were 42 guidelines and each competent minister have the very strong enforcement power, Japanese government. It, it's a yeah, very strong bureaucratic power in Japan. Therefore, every Japanese company have to com comply with, and uh, the, from the point of the compliance, the Japanese company have to comply with the, the order and guidelines of the each minister. So it means, even if it's, it, is, it seems it's like just a voluntary guideline, however, in Japan, guideline means it is almost the same as the law. Therefore, each company and every company has have to try to comply with these guidelines. Therefore, even if without any such a central supervisory authority, from the point of the compliance and compliance to the personal information protection law and the enforcement of the personal information protection law, we don't have any uh, problem and regarding the, any concern regarding the enforcement of the law in domestic. But we have a problem for the enforcement of the cross-border enforcement of the law. Therefore, we need to establish the central uh, Supervisor Okay, let's thank one more time Professor Fumio for his very nice presentation. Uh, Kishike san, any more, any progress with our remote participation? Okay. Okay, so I wanted Professor Murai to talk a little bit. It is not possible, right? But like uh, the Professor Foster would like to have some words, the last of the presentation. Okay, okay great. So we we'll move to our third speaker, Professor McCarin from University of Indonesia. Thank you very much, moderator. As, uh, see, okay. I refer to uh, the topic of uh, this workshop, privacy, privacy in Asia. And one aspect of privacy is personal data protection. Uh, the moderator raised uh, about the five questions. Next slide, please. What is the current framework? And then how do you assess prospect for greater alignment, harmonization of national privacy regimes across the Asian region? The third one will be resulting as an approach to privacy protection differ in some respect from those now being developed in the US and within the EU. And what implication does this have for global privacy governance? Number four, who are the key actors in the, private, in the privacy debate in your country and what are their roles and powers? And the, five, the fifth question is, how have data privacy regulation in your country affected business utilization of cloud services and big data? I move to the, to the first question. I could say I could say that uh, Indonesian legal framework for privacy indirectly make a hybrid paradigm of European Union, United States, OECD guide, uh, guidance principles, and also EPIC privacy framework. Why? Because until now we do not enact a particular law regarding the general uh, the data protection. But almost similar for some countries. Privacy as a term or privacy as legal terminology maybe you cannot find in the constitutions. Maybe only some countries have privacy as legal terminology clearly explicitly as a privacy in the constitution. If I'm not mistaken, almost a majority in the constitution saying in personal life. So 
in Indonesian legal hierarchy, the first thing that we should raise is privacy as personal life had already protected in Indonesian constitutions. But instead of the human rights, we have also a liability to appreciate, to respect the other's human rights. And also we have liability for security. That is based on constitutions. And then we have also Indonesian law on human rights. In this context, we have a focus for security and property. And we have also Indonesian law on consumer protection rights, security and comfortable. So I will uh, explain a little bit uh, what is the, our paradigm in the next slide. But I would like to raise every law in Indonesia would be implemented based on leg specialists, derogate leg generalists. So if we have a particular law or special law, so we would like to implement that instead or except in that special law do not have do not have detailed provision so we should refer to the general provision because indonesia inherit codifications uh, traditions like european continental and then until now we still uh, prepare a uh, special law but it doesn't mean we do not have any provision regarding privacy and data protection because we have Indonesian law and electronic information and transaction law. In this law, we had also government regulation, 82-2012. We have a standard protection for privacy and personal data and in online. And then we have uh, some other specific law raising about the personal data protection as a secrecy also. Next slide, please. Based on this diagram, in the narrow definition, it is common that talking about privacy, everything that might be interfere your personal life, your security. But in the broad definition, everything outside of yours, communications, that might be have impact to your personal life. So, in the narrow definition only may be secured, but anything that might be impact to your personal life, such as someone had already obtained your data, your personal data illegally, or maybe unethically or misappropriate. So in this context, I could say that privacy, not only talking about the private spheres and personal life, but also anything that might be influence your comfortable. Based on to uh, previous regime, if we refer to European Union's perspective, they focus on the objective approach. They pay attention too much for the personal data protection as a good or as a noun, so everything's move this off this object that maybe have a law and uh, have a perspective on that. Compared to this perspective is uh, United States perspective. Privacy based on expectational privacy, uh, expectation to privacy or reasonable expectation to privacy. If you do not, if you don't expect the privacy, government should not pay attention for these matters too much because in the context civil to civil or citizen to citizen and business to citizens, it's up to you, it's up to them, to their consensus. It would be uh, inefficient in economy if everything governments have interferes for the personal communication, for the business communications. So that's why we, we think that it would be better for Indonesian combined of all of the paradigm. So we have a, a hybrid paradigm. And uh, next slide, please. Looking at to the Article 26, basically, the first, in, I'm, in my opinion, the first uh, priority for privacy and data protection is approval of the subject's data. So, in this article, we have uh, uh, a provision saying that regarding personal data should be met with the approval of the relevant persons. And uh, section two in, the, in this article, any person whose rights are violated 
as referred to in paragraph 1, may file a lawsuit for damage based on this act. If, if I'm not mistaken, until now we don't have criminal provisions about privacy. We do not have a criminal provision, but we have lawsuit for damage. So it depends on the subject, it's uh, her or himself. Look at the government regulation 82. Next slide, please. Electronic system operator shall maintain secrecy, integrity, and availability of personal data under, under its management. Ensure that acquisition, use, and use of personal data, personal data is based on the owner consent unless otherwise provided by laws and regulation. Warrant the use or disclosure of the data was based on the consent of the owner of such personal data and in accordance with the objective presented to the owner of personal data on acquisition of data. If there is a failure in the protection of confidential private data it managed, electronic system operator shall notify in writing the owner of such personal data, subject data. Further provision on personal data protection guidelines in electronic system referred to in paragraph 2, regulation of the minister. So it means we, in the short term period, we would like to make a minister regulation regarding the privacy and data protection guidance. In the long term, we are we, we now are making or drafting the Indonesian law for data protection. One of my colleagues, one of the drafter is in the, in the first line, Ibu Sinta from Pajajar University. And then we have also articles, okay, five minutes, okay. Article 66, section 1.8, saying that privacy trust mark. So we are on the right track, in my opinion, because we have uh, effort to adopt basic principle of the APEC privacy framework by giving uh, role playing to the uh, independent professional to audit and give a privacy mark. And then for the question two and question three, you can find that Asian region for privacy because we our uh, Asian country have a special value, communal value, paternalistic, religious, and tolerance. It would be better for Asian develop their own standard to appreciate their local wisdom. Maybe this is not uh, the same with the European Union and the United States perspective that most that countries uh, have individualism value. Asian country, most of us have a common law tradition and also continental, continental tradition, but blended with the customary and religious tradition. And then, look at the next slide, please. This is show, showing that uh, we need a uh, privacy trust map. Next slide, please. I'm very sorry. Almost five minutes. Okay. Another slide, please. This is showing that I, uh, we have uh, ICT master plan and we have uh, integrity, community, integration and also community. Next slide, please. We would like to uh, develop regional interoperability in trust. And then, please. This is many SRO, uh, self-regulation organization, based on, and civil society organization is the key actors, are the key actors in developing privacy guidelines. So. Each law may, may have one implementing agency, uh, a blended government, and also the community. Next slide, please. And the question five, implication to cloud computing and big data. We have article 15, law of EIT. Give uh, the principles of this article is presumed liability. So electronic system provider should be liable for everything because uh, they should guarantee the accountability of the e-system. Every provider shall deliver their system in reliable, secure, and they are responsible to the operation of the electronic system working properly. Except if the malfunction, if the malfunction or the mistakes uh, because of the customers or the users or the maybe the false major conditions. That's my last presentation.
please next slide. Okay, that is my notes that I propose that uh, Asian country would have their own standard regarding privacy, but accommodate APEC privacy frameworks, rules, and uh, standards also. Thank you very much. Okay, uh, thank you very much, Professor McAllen. Uh, let's see if you have any quick questions. We, can, we have time for three. Yes, please. Thank you. Uh, my name is Mark I am a legal researcher. Uh, I will give comment to the presentation of uh, Edmund. In some degree, I agree that privacy in Indonesia is not constitutional right, at least not written clearly on the Constitution. But I want to give comment on socio-legal perspective. In my opinion, privacy don't have socio-legal foundation in Indonesia because historically and sociologically, Indonesian people are collective people, a collective society, not like uh, European people who or uh, US people who tends to be individual. In Indonesia, it's something like normal to ask, what is your age? Are you married? Uh, uh, anything that defined as privacy in Western society. Also, if we try to Indonesian building, Indonesian people house, 20 years ago, there is no rooms, no private rooms in Indonesian house. Uh, in Indonesian people houses with no room. Uh, uh, if they have room, they don't have door. Because uh, privacy is, there is no concept of privacy in Indonesia. It's uh, similar with other ASEAN communities, mo uh, most of uh, collective societies uh, don't think that privacy is a big deal. Privacy is rather than implanted concept uh, from uh, from Western concept, Western culture that adapted in maybe about last 10 years in Asia. Oh, thank, thank you. you. Uh, do you want the response from Professor Makarim for that? Yeah, just, okay. just adding information. Okay. Would you yeah. like to respond to that? Uh, I'm agree. So that's okay, why yes. I think that uh, our privacy may be, uh, to call that, it's not similar with the Western values. So that's why we make a hybrid paradigm. So we should blend the European Union's perspective and also the United States and follow the standard for the APEC privacy framework also. So that is the condition of our social behaviors. Yeah. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank okay. You. So, okay. We have time for two, so there are four people. Let's see. Let's start from the behind, okay? Okay. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. He. Uh, uh, yeah. Sorry. <laughs> I just wonder if I could follow up on that last uh, comment just a little bit, and I wonder how far you would push that. Um, I know this came up uh, many years ago at a, uh, an ICANN meeting in, uh, in Africa where something similar was said, and I wonder if, if you feel the same way when you think about, say, let's say, a company that is mining your personal data to create a profile and a pattern uh, about you that you don't know that they're creating this pattern about you um, and using that you know, for commercial gain. Do you still feel that that's not something that an Indonesian attitude or cultural approach would see that as an invasion of privacy in some way? I just wonder how far you push this idea of you don't really care about privacy. Yeah. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, in my second slide, I had already shown that there is also Indonesian law regarding consumer protection. So they have also a special agency for their protection. And also they have civil society regarding that. So the last case is uh, regarding about spamming and stealing of the data posts of the customers become a, what you call that, a big cases for Indonesia. And the operators worry too much about that. And then uh, I could say that we had already pushed that thinking 
And the evidence is we had already have a provision on the law number 11, 2008, that everything of your subject's data should have approval from he or herself. That's it. Okay, uh, time for only one. And can you get from one of those, uh, the lady probably, then? <laughs> Um, hi, I had uh, two questions. Um, the Let's first one was one right now. Okay, well, <laughs> just quickly. Um, the first one was regarding your comments on the expectation of privacy, um, and just wondering how that interlinks with the fact that people are not informed uh, about their rights to privacy. So, if you're not informed about your right to privacy and how it can impact you, um, how are you supposed to develop uh, an idea of what expectations you have? For, for your protection uh, of your privacy, just if you can comment on that. Okay, it's quite a hard question if we say reasonable expectation to privacy. Referring to the what is development based on the Universal Declaration of Human Rights become to ICCPR, uh, privacy, previously 100% privacy, and we don't add something, right? But after that, we can found in the International Convention of Human Rights saying reasonable, right? And also, it's, uh, it's happened in the uh, U.S. So, there is not a good balance in the public interest if you pay attention too much for the privacy, but you forget about the public interest. So, the balance of this condition is Ex reasonable expectation to privacy. But on the other hand, we need also a legal profession saying that everyone should have a liability to obtain the other personal data of some persons legally. So we put that may on that uh, on the ministry regulation in the futures. But now in the conditions, subject uh, expectation to privacy based on the uh, the individual to he or himself. If he or she found that his personal data had already obtained by others, by company, they can sue them. And also if this uh, standard is not followed by business organization, I believe they don't have a privacy trust mark. Because one provision regarding electronic system is certified by professionals based on some certain standard of the government regulations. Is that uh, clear, uh, clear to answer your question? Okay, thank you very much. But unfortunately, I would like to know also about the floor. So please. So, let's uh, do this. Yeah, there yeah. are at least three more people who yeah. want to ask questions. Let's hold them until the end of the session. Uh, Okay, then also we can, we can directly ask Professor McCarrie after the session if we do not have enough time. And let's try one more time with our remote participants if it works. Then we move to Mr. Yan about uh, privacy. He will be talking a lot of things. Okay, uh, Keisha Kishan, uh, is our remote participant online now? Or? Okay. Yeah, Professor Foster is here. Okay, uh, okay, let's hold this for some time, okay? Uh, is that okay? Or well, 
Professor Foster and probably uh, if anyone has quick question to ask him one question or can you do that <laughs> okay no maybe we'll get back later uh, our next speaker is this uh, from Microsoft Asia director based in Singapore and he is a Chinese born Canadian living in Singapore and works for a US company so he, will, he has a lot of experiences about privacy. Okay, then. Thank you, Professor Nier. As, uh, as we just witnessed, when technology works, it works wonder. But as I always say, it needs to be and can be simpler. Um, it, and thanks, Professor Nier, for uh, emphasizing the fact that I'm, I'm, I have a rather complicated background. And I mentioned that to, uh, to my co-panelists in an email to illustrate the fact that, you know, given people are becoming, like people like myself is becoming more like a norm, you know, because people travel around the world and, and live in different places. When it comes to personal data and, and data protection, it is a, a cross-border issue by nature. Um, I titled my uh, presentation as uh, putting people first, building trust in big data world. 
as we, we truly believe that there is a, 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 a crisis or a, a deficit of trust in the current internet ecosystem. And, and to rebuild or restore that kind of trust, we really need to come back to the, to the fundamental putting, by putting people first, in which I will elaborate what I mean uh, in, in a bit time. And also, um, stress beyond the, the, the title of building on the APEC pri privacy principle and, and, and try to be pushing the envelope a little bit, saying how do we do that beyond the current set of the privacy principles. Uh, if we can move to the next slide. I have a rather simple outline of my presentation, um, not strictly following the professor's five questions. I apologize for that. I seem to have that habit since my university years. Um, but I think as a technology company uh, who operates uh, globally, uh, we probably can best add value uh, just to kind of share our view of how um, the landscape, you know, the digital world that we're living in has changed, has transformed very dramatically, and that actually requires us to take a different look, to take a, a new model towards privacy legislation, um, and how we can leverage technology in doing that. And I'll talk a little bit about, uh, in my personal view, why Asia could actually take a lead in the world. Um, and it's certainly in a, a very tall order, but uh, there, there are fundamental reasons, I believe, that Asia could take a lead. And last but not least, I'll, I'll touch upon a bit about uh, Microsoft's own trustworthy data practice, how we um, put privacy first in our product design, in our um, service offerings. So with that, um, you know, as I have you know, the fortune of sharing this stage, uh, if I, we can move to the next slide, please. With, with four distinguished professors, and I, there are more on, on, the, on our remote side, I'd like to make up the short for in me by quoting a fond professor of mine who often say to his students, saying, you know, feel free to ask me for past year's exams. We as students always did like to do that. But just bear in mind that the questions might be the same. The answers might actually now be different. And I think that very statement is very true to our privacy debate, that the fundamental privacy needs and concerns you know, of human being remain the same throughout the years, but the solution is likely going to be different now since the digital world that we are living in is vastly different from, let's say, the 1980s when the, the first set of OECD uh, principles was drafted, or even back in 1995 when was the most of the governments starting to uh, establish the privacy and security regulation around the world. We also need to bear in mind that the landscape, you know, two, three years from now in 2015 and then 2020 will be also significantly different than what it is today. Um, and, you know, today many of the Asian governments are just starting to define the data protection regime and then privacy legislation as we, we just heard from my co-panelists. And what the challenges are, you know, have these legislation which are put in place or being put in place accounted for the changes that have occurred over the past decade, and will these legislation survive the continued and most likely will be accelerated land shift in the, in the future? So, you know, to start, let's, let's take a quick look at how the world has changed, uh, you know, into what we, you know, known as the big data world. Um, by some estimate, there are almost three zettabytes of information that are created just in the year 2012. And in case you're not familiar with zettabytes, three zettabytes is actually three billion terabytes. So you, you now everyone has these terabyte drives. You know, imagine three billion of them filled with just one year of information. And you know, this information deluge is still growing at about 50% year by year. And also in the recent decade, we have seen you know a lot of technology advances that come together to enable an even greater um, explosion of data, you know, fueled by the social networking, fueled by the, you know, pro proliferation of devices, and, and in the shortcoming future, it will be fueled by the machine-to-machine -machine communication, generating all kinds of uh, uh, passively collected data. So in other words, the technology revolution and the data explosion has really challenged 
the relatively slower pace of the regulatory evolution. I'll give you three examples, you know, uh, that's depicted in this graph, you know, the cloud computing slash big data, social networking, and Internet of Things. As one of the example, the cloud, the advent of the cloud has fundamentally redefined how, where, and whom, by whom the data is correct, collected and used and exchanged. In the cloud computing era, data and processing are all moved out of the personal computer, moved out of the direct control of the users into the cloud. And the cloud-based data by nature will flow across multiple boundaries of national borders and therefore regulatory regimes. Big data is big in, in, in sort of four dimensions, if you will. There's a volume, velocity, you know, at the speed the data has to be processed, there's a variety of data in terms of, you know, the type of data. 90% of big data are actually unstructured data. And the last but not least is also the value of big data, which is really central to the privacy debate as well, because we do believe there's a need to strike balance between data protection, but also mining and getting value out of the big data, which has a societal impact quite fundamental. Um, you know, there's a good phrase that summarizes this, this, this quite well, which says data is the new currency in the digital economy. So if data is the new currency, it, it is really valuable, and it's really not for us to just, just try to suppress it, but rather, you know, say, how do we maximize the value of data while still protecting the fundamental needs of privacy and protection? The other, the other uh, major fact, force that's driving the uh, uh, data explosion, oh, it's 25 minutes, wow, um, it's the social networking. And what that changes is the way that people voluntarily, you know, produce the data, you know, it used to be the user are just the data subject, but now the data users are also the data producers. And, you know, despite all the privacy concerns, if you look at YouTube, if you look at, you know, Facebook, people are very eager uh, and willing to disclose much of the personal data uh, and share with the world. And how do we balance that, you know, desire with, you know, and, and the, the legal rights that the users have? Last but not the least, the Internet of Things, you know, the advent of machine-to-machine uh, -machine communication is going to produce, I would argue, the vast majority of the data that's going to be generated in the future, which is passively collected or passively produced. So all that really points to the fact that the landscape has really changed in terms of volume, velocity, and variety of data, and the value of data that, that we're, we need to deal with. If we can move to the next slide. So the natural, the natural conclusion is that we really need a new model, a new policy framework that can adapt to the technology changes, and also the changes in societal norms that we, we just mentioned. In this graph, uh, which is trying to depict a, a, a rather user-centric, and holistic approach towards building trustworthy data system uh, that we would like to call uh, is broader than just privacy and data protection. Uh, due to the, um, um, sorry, the, the previous slide. The previous one, sorry. Uh, I'm not there yet. Last one. Yep. So in, in this, um, because of the length of time, I'll just highlight two components. One is, you know, shifting the policy focus from data collection to data usage. In the traditional world, um, in, even in the OECD principle, et cetera, the, 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 the emphasis is really on, in order to protect the users, we really need to constrain the organizations from collecting data at the outset. And that's really, you know, in the big data world, it may not be actually the appropriate mentality. What we really advocate is that the, the legislation and policy focus should be moved towards how the data are used in, in, in the usage points, rather than trying to suppress the origin of data, because the data will be gone if we don't collect at the right time, at the right place, and the value might be lost. And the really um, scrutiny should be really put on how, who and where and how the data are used. And that's actually easier said than done. So therefore, that's where, where we advocate another component that needs to be in integral part of this, this, this uh, model is the technology part. You know, technology itself drives the phenomenon of big data, but it can also provide 
policymakers with a great tool which never, never had before to deal with the challenges uh, imposed by the, by the big data. And what I mean by that, if you see the, the lower right um, part of the um, chart, it depicts a, a way of wrapping the data around with what we call the metadata. So essentially, if, you, if, you, if I were to make an analogy, um, just like the IP routing header that everyone is familiar with, which is essential in helping you know, moving the data pack packets across global networks to, towards this desired destination. In a similar way, if we were to attach a header to, to any piece of data that's traversing across network, across the national boundary, with a set of metadata that basically tracks its providence, its you know, privacy control elements, that actually allows the data to be protected whenever it's accessed because the metadata is permanently bound to the data and it's encrypted together. So this is one of the what we call metadata architecture that we're um, proposing for policymakers around the world to adopt so that, you know, as, as you can imagine, we travel around the world as human beings, what we need is a passport which identify ourselves and also get ourselves protected by foreign authorities when we travel. In a similar notion, you can think of it as a data passport. The data, each piece of data is given a passport that identifies itself to this rightful user, but also protect itself from the unauthorized users. Um, moving to the next slide, considering time. Um, given what I just said, none of those are actually currently implemented in, the, in today's um, privacy legislation. Much of the uh, today's regulatory approach are actually based on the traditional notice and consent mode, which many of us already acknowledge that it's actually not sufficient. In many times that users are not able to, are only given a binary um, selection or binary choice in terms of opting or opt out. And we know as a user, we want to have a finer granularity of control and choices when it comes to disclosing our data. You know, it's, users sometimes are very willing to disclose certain amount of personal data in exchange for economic return. Like we do when we go to a, a grocery store, we sign up for, 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 a, for a discount card. That's a, this one example. So Asia, in my opinion, can actually lead the world in embracing this new model. Um, and simply, you know, I don't, we don't have time to go through the details, and I welcome you to look at the, the PowerPoint later. But I, w I, I would, you know, articulate a couple of reasons that which I believe Asia can take a lead. Uh, we, Asia is characterized by a, 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 a predominantly a developing country. You know, we have a few of the largest e de developing economy in Asia, where the population, the sheer population itself, just drives the scale of data. And with, with, you know, in cloud computing, big data world scale equals to um, the ability to mine data, the ability to actually you know, gain insights and, and intelligence out of data. Um, it, many people actually argue in the, in the field of, uh, like, uh, for example, biomedical research, uh, the Asian world can actually take a lead because they have much more sample to work with. That's one reason. The second reason Asia can take a lead, in my opinion, is that Asia, as you know, predominantly developing uh, economy, needs to have the bigger motivation to actually utilize technology in a much bigger scale. And cloud computing is one example that can actually elevate uh, the Asian economy um, and, and catching up with, with the world leaders. And to do that, you really need to be able to deploy the cloud computing in a much larger scale. And therefore, that is another motivation for Asian regulators to actually take a larger stand. I'll try to wrap up in the next one to two minutes. Um, next slide, please. Um, briefly, um, Singapore has just uh, you know, put in place a Personal Data uh, Protection Act um, last year, um, actually earlier this year, and it will come into force in July 2nd next year. So this is a one good example where you know, among the uh, Asian countries, um, there are only a few countries, as we heard, that have uh, uh, privacy legislation in place and have dedicated uh, privacy commission uh, as a single authority to actually enforce the law. And that, I think, is a very important point to, uh, to, to stress. And I encourage people to actually look at the, at the Singapore. Not, I mean, not, by no means it's, a, it's, it's perfect and complete, but it nonetheless is a very good example to, to reference. And last, uh, if we can move to the last slide. 
But now, least, I, I would just answer the last question that Professor Neer posted earlier, you know, how data privacy regulation affect business utilization of cloud services and big data. The short answer is that, you know, the concern about privacy and security of data definitely impacts the adoption of cloud computing and big data. And as a major cloud computing company, we therefore are very, you know, interested in working with regulators and governments around the world to make sure that we instill and restore trust in the data ecosystem. Um, we, um, we, have, we have this um, 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 principle, as it's called, the privacy by design, which basically um, mandates that all our product groups and all our services and uh, our operating procedures have privacy control designed in the day one as a, uh, as a design principle. And Microsoft, as an organization, we have over 500 professionals who are full-time dedicated to privacy uh, requirements and enforcement. And that's just how we think, you know, by putting the people first, our business model is really all about serving our customer who pay us directly by using our services and our software. So we're not so much depending on mining data of our users, but rather protecting their data and for their purpose. Um, given a short time, I'll just stop here and I welcome questions. Okay, thank you. We have, uh, okay, time is already uh, 10.40. We started a little late uh, due to the technical problem and still have a little bit time for the question probably. Let's see if anyone has anything to ask them about this, please. Uh, yeah, okay, then one, two, three, first, let's take. Okay, short question, please. Is it okay if I give comments to all? I mean, uh, it's just, I just would like to share my views on the speakers. I think... Maybe, maybe half a minute, 30 seconds. Okay. From the speakers, it's clear that privacy can be seen from the constitutional perspectives and also the business perspectives. And both business and constitutional perspectives have social and technical impacts. To, when we discuss about the, how the Asian countries could harmonize the national regimes. So we should also consider how the Asian countries see the privacy. Would, would, would we see the consider protecting privacy is protecting human rights? Or should we see the pri protection, protecting privacy in the context of developing e-commerce or for economic purpose? So that's the difference between the EPIC privacy framework and the EU uh, uh, approach. So what I would like to ask to the speakers is that how would you see concerning this issue? What would uh, bridge the, the perspective that would bridge the Asian countries? Thank you. Okay, would you like Jeff to address that question or? Okay, do you have the response for that? Uh, oh, no, I, I don't mind. Yeah, yeah it, it's a very good question. I, I think, as I mentioned earlier, the, the, the whole privacy debate really needs to strike a balance between the need to protect privacy and, and, and data versus also the other policy objectives such as innovation and trade. Um, and I believe in the earlier presentation, I also heard that there's also a balance of, you know, uh, public interests versus, you know, uh, individual, individuality. And, and what I can say is that this really um, has need to take into consideration the context of the cultural norm. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, in, in societies like Indonesia, it's more of a collective society. But in the society of the U.S., maybe it's a more of an indi individuality. So that, that, that balance may be different in terms of where the balance point is, different from country to country. But nonetheless, I think there's a, a, it's always a, a one of the big challenges to strike that balance. Okay, please. I have a, a question for for Microsoft, a speaker from Microsoft, and then a question also for the Indonesian speaker. I hope it's okay. okay Only one first, question. First, let's ask to Dave. Then we'll come back to all the okay, speakers all right. if um, we have more time. My my question is, um, uh, what is your definition of big data? Because you seem to, I mean, it seems like a lot of data is big data. A lot of data is not big data. Somebody gave me a definition that big data must include real time element. So it's kind of an interesting idea. So I'd like to know your, your thoughts on the definition. Thank you. Um, I don't know if there's an actual official definition of big data. I mean, Wikipedia probably has one. But in our uh, opinion, I think big data really refers to this 
you know, not only just the volume aspect, you know, the volume is exceeding any, the processing capability of any individual machines, and therefore it requires the cloud computing type of infrastructure to process. But also it refers to, you know, as I mentioned, in, in terms of the velocity, in terms of the, the, the real timeness of the data that needs to be crunched and to be, you know, produced, because the value of the data actually lose, you know, by the time goes by. There's a life cycle aspect to the big data. So I think there's multiple uh, dimensions towards what makes it big. It's not just volume. Okay, one, okay, one more for Jeff, then. Well, thank you for your very interesting uh, presentation about this governance perspective, about this privacy. And I think uh, in general, like, we have challenge of this harmonization and in the, like, national level and regional level and then global level. And one of your slides uh, was indicating that the current OECD principles uh, doesn't really seem to be inadequate. Uh, could you kind of like explain uh, what kind of like OECD principles are not quite adequate, like uh, in terms of this, the, you know, the privacy perspective? Yeah. So um, I was more referring to the the uh, old one, and I actually heard from uh, from you, Sam, that there was actually a new release of the OECD uh, guidelines, which I really you know, look forward to, to reading. But in, in the existing ones. You know, there are things that are still hold, like, for example, you know, the, the security safeguard, the accountability principles, but there are other, like, you know, collection limitation, just as one example, which we really think need to be, you know, progressed or move forward. As I mentioned, we really need to move from restriction of collection towards more of scrutinization on how the data are used. So, you know, from, from that focus to, you know, who and how and where the data are processed, in what way. So that's just one example. And another example is, you know, in terms of the um, con um, notice and consent, whether or not we actually, you know, and, and how the consent are should be to be obtained. Because in many cases, as we know, it's very hard for users to actually predict how the data is going to be used. And therefore, for them to actually give us consent up front actually doesn't make quite, quite make sense. And, and it's just those kind of challenges um, that the, today's world has actually made it very hard than, let's say, you know, back in 1980s when, when the first OECD principle was drafted. That's what I mean. Yeah. Okay. Uh, if you have any question that you would like to ask our remote presenter, Professor Foster, uh, we might take one question for him, and one is for Professor Fumio and Professor uh, Edmond. Then we we'll close the session. And if you want to inter, if you'd like to interact more after that, then you can do it. Uh, these uh, panelists probably. Uh, anyone has anything to ask Professor Foster, or if Professor Foster wants to add something? Okay, thanks, Well, I'd be happy to uh, uh, answer a question if somebody has it directly. I think, uh, as I said before, one of the big tech takeaways that I have from this, uh, particularly to the FN, and of course, there's a very interesting uh, discussion uh, by Jeff, with one of my, my close friends, is that you really have to address a lot of basic questions. And I think uh, that those of us who are in the academic field or involved in research in the sector have a big job in asking, in asking the right questions and uh, in that particular context beginning to approach the solution. I'll be mindful, uh, as Jeff was saying, uh, that the solutions are going to be moving ahead uh, about even if we're trying to come close to them uh, because of the really driving force of, uh, of the technology. So, I think we need to get privacy right, uh, and I think it's one of the really fundamental issues uh, with respect to the uh, uh, future of the Internet. And uh, given how important the Internet is in the context of security in the Asian economy, for innovation, for competition, for uh, economic growth, uh, it's certainly something I think we're going to come back to again and again. And so I encourage those of the audience uh, who are engaged with this topic, interested, uh, uh, we have a real open door in terms of the, the group that we're trying to put together here in Asia to get to know each other better, talk about these issues, and uh, develop uh, uh, solutions. So uh, 
love to hear from you and uh, hope that uh, we can continue this conversation both within and outside the uh, idea framework. Okay, thank you, Jim. Okay, let's see. Uh, one question is for uh, Professor Edmond and Professor Fumio, probably. Anyone has anything to so you want, you'd like to ask to Come here, okay. Uh, professor, since the topic is, uh, we are in the term of building the APEC principles, what is the Japanese uh, perspective? Because you also apply uh, the new OECD rather than the APEC privacy framework. Mm -hmm. Do, can you uh, explain the reason of the Japanese uh, perspective? Thank you. The perspective to, to the new OECD privacy guideline. Uh, so actually, the basic principle, eight principle, has not yet been changed. There are no there are no change to the new even if the new OECD guideline. Therefore, uh, for example, the privacy enforcement authority is one of the factor for uh, consider to establish new new authority for Japanese government. Uh, and also privacy management program and the security breach notification is also that we have to consider have to uh, follow and have to struggle with to to do that. But actually, we the the current Japanese law doesn't have any uh, obligation to notify such a security breach incident. However, Japanese company try to uh, notify uh, the government. The mean it means the ministry the when a security breach occur. So therefore, these factors uh, that we have to follow, and we have to consider how to follow to uh, to to the the new OECD guideline. However, there were no changes regarding the eight basic principles. Okay, thank you. Last question to Professor Makarim. Anyone has anything to ask him? No? Okay. So, from that side. Yes. Um, I found it very interesting. Sorry, Patrick from Fiji. I found it very interesting that um, the, the Indonesians had this unique approach to privacy not being a very important issue. And it says a lot to the Indonesian people that they uh, they have such trust. With, uh, between their people. But I think that you might be um, overlooking an important factor that, uh, you know, the, a lot of the issues that, or the incidents that involve uh, privacy violations are uh, multinational. A lot of the problems that you're trying to address are not uh, because of Indonesian players, but because of uh, bad people around the world. And uh, by making privacy uh, or approaching privacy in the sense that uh, uh, government shouldn't get involved, it should be a civil matter. You, you might be um, putting your people at risk, um, you know, because a lot of the data, the privacy data that's out there can be used in attacks like um, social engineering attacks, advanced persistent threats, and uh, you know, if, you're, if government doesn't take an active stance in protecting their people's privacy, uh, they're opening up um, you know, your people to attacks from outside players, something that I think uh, you might be uh, overlooking. Quite long sentence, sorry. Okay, like, uh, make it short. It was undisputed that every individual needs a protection for the privacy in the broader circle and the personal data as his or her properties. Look at to the uh, one example of the, maybe some company saying that this is a good fit. When I buy this laptop, there is no condition for me. I can separate this hardware and the software. And one time I stick this on, what should I do? I should surrender, surrender should give my personal data based on the liability. So now let's think out of the box for the future's uh, discussion. Do we refer to the privacy or to the personal data? Privacy, it means if someone had already make me unpleasant for their uh, doing or their acting or might be based on myself I surrender 
to data. So in this context, do the country should have influence based on the government authority playing more than the expectation to the, the individual, him or herself. For the top protections, yes, maybe to certain conditions, countries or government should have a role and power for doing that. So, this harmony may be because of we do not give the formulation in effective context, in appropriate context. So, uh, like Joshua raised about the constitutional perspective and the business perspective, I'm worried a lot in the future be because of the government and the business. Look at the Microsoft and NSA. We do not have, we cannot say anything if Microsoft gives my personal data to the NSA and profiling me. See? Based on the national security, big data, who has big data? Who is the owner of the big data? Collecting big data with no consent and no independent condition to the users, is that big data? No. You have big trust from the users. It's not relevant saying that it is I have a right to access because since the beginning I surrender the data with no choice. Thank you very much. That is the end of the my Okay, thank you everyone and let's thank our panelists one more time. Um, okay. So if you have any more thing that you'd like to ask the individual panelists, feel free to do so. Uh, sorry, already a little late. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. 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 Thank